Hey there, Shayla. Thanks for joining us here on the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. We are excited to chat with you. First of all, uh, before we even dig in and get to know you, I just want to say your background is pretty awesome. It's nice. Ah, it's, it's very, you know, yeah. John, like, yeah, it's very, yeah, I would say like maybe modern or like, yeah. I don't know, industrial. Makes me think, better. it makes me think you're like in some, some like San Francisco office, you know, where there's a bunch of people and you're like at like, headquarters of some cool place you know that's what that, that's what got that's what it looks like yeah so well I, I was just gonna say so what what we'll do is we'll ask you are you in san francisco <laughs> are you somewhere else tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh welcome to the show <laughs> thank you this beautiful background is my garage <laughs> <laughs> i love it love it that is Not awesome beautiful. i want yeah. your garage wonderful yeah, I love being outside. It really inspires me. I love the sunlight. Um, and with COVID and everyone working at home and the kids at home, it was important to have a separate space. So we built this little sunroom off of awesome. my garage. Um, and it's where I get all of my work done. It is, uh, I love it. I, I really love it. I think that it's awesome. really inspirational. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Yeah. Fill us, fill us in, uh, let our listeners know a little bit about, you know, your, yourself, where, where are you based out of, um, which, you know, how you got into education and, and your current role. And uh, then we'll, we'll dig in. Right, sure. Um, so I've, I've always been into education. I started tutoring when I was really young and I went to school, uh, for math first and then for education. And I worked with a lot of big companies, um, and I taught as well as designed curriculum for uh, them. And I got into a space where uh, it was it was sort of like a, a morality or a calling sort of um, situation where on the one side, I couldn't afford to put my own kids in the classes I created. Right? Um, right. So working for some of those great companies, they have large price tags on them. Uh, and I would say, I want my kid to participate in this. And even with my salary and sometimes discounts, uh, it was too much to put my own kids in. And I thought, this is a problem. Like we need to be able to have quality, high engaging material that is available to everyone, um, not just a select few. Uh, and then on the other side, a lot of it was just so boring. And I, <laughs> I thought we got a better way to learn than this, right? Like uh, there is use for textbooks um, and lectures, but especially for our younger kids, like we don't want to instill this sort of hatred of school and unenjoyment right. of learning. Uh, and I really wanted it to be fun. And so I took a dive um, and I started mapping. I said, we're going to make this really affordable and we're going to make this really fun. Um, and I'm going to hope that we can impact a lot of students, um, this way. I love it. I love it. I love that you've given us sort of a, a bit of a, uh, an understanding of your journey. It sounds like, you know, math's always been something that you've had some sort of, you know, affinity for, or, or you either enjoyed it, or maybe, maybe you just felt like you were quote unquote good at it. I'm curious to learn more about that. And sometimes that comes out through our next question with our guests. And that is, you know, what is that math moment that you remember from your educational experience as a student? Was it positive? Was it negative? Did it influence how you went down this pathway because you were excited about what you did as a student? Did you head down this pathway because maybe you were maybe underwhelmed as a student? I'm curious what math moment pops out to you when you think math class? It's so funny. I knew this question was coming. You think I would have prepared more for it? <laughs> I know. You know hey, as we start asking it, you start going, oh, shoot, I remember now. Oh, darn. <laughs> um, no, it was uh, actually uh, in the eighth grade. I had a teacher for geometry, and she was um, an in service teacher, you know, uh, someone doing her final years of college and, and sort of doing her practicum. Um, and she didn't understand the math. She did not understand mm -hmm. geometry. Um, and they actually, the school actually gave me an award that year. Uh, and, and one of the other students said, if you weren't in our class, I don't think we would have learned anything. Mm. Um, and that was, it's, it's a horrible moment, right? Or it's like, yeah. the teacher's supposed to be the expert in the room. They weren't. I never really thought about being good at math or anything like that. Like I, I did it and I didn't love it or, or hate it. Um, 
But in that year, I was like, I can do this and I can help other people do this. And that's like, that's pretty awesome. Uh, and and since then, I, I guess I have been, quote unquote, a math kid. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> I have to say, in, in your uh, interview with Dr. Um, Susan Elliott, you actually, some of the things you said about that, about being a math kid, it was like you were quoting directly from my book. Um, so I found it really mm. funny because I don't believe there is such a thing as a math kid. Um, but I kind of lean into that idea um, because I know that it's a common mis misconception. Uh, and so we sort of lean into that and then tear it apart. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, no. And and I think, you know, when you think about, I just had this glimpse of this moment, of, you know, like you're saying the teacher is supposed to be the expert in the room, but then you, you know, because you had that almost, almost like a preconceived notion that that's supposed to be the math teacher, you know, in the room. But then think about, how much ownership you felt about being in that role in like having a say in, you know, helping other kids, you know, think about their teaching and or think about their learning and, and what typically normally, you know, happens in math class where the teacher is seeing themselves or everyone sees them as the, you know, the, the expert in the room. And we all kind of wait around and see what they are going to tell us instead of having that experience where, you know, like, Oh, I I've got a role here too. I'm not, it's not just me. That's the, you know, the, the expert, uh, or that is the teacher that's care. I can be the expert as well. So I'm curious, Shayla, like how, how did, does that moment, you know, like obviously it's stuck with you. So how does that moment influence what you're doing for, for students in classrooms today? Uh, I think it has totally informed my pedagogical approach. Um, I, I went to school, I started going to school in mathematics education, and I was actually taken aback by how little math there was. Um, yeah. there was lots <laughs> of pedagogy classes, there was like no math classes. And so exactly. I my major to mathematics um, and got my undergraduate and graduate certificate in math and then went back to the education field. Because like, if I'm going to teach this, I don't, I want to really know it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see that obviously was a big impact. But then in the classroom now as a teacher, I, I don't like to be the stage on stage, even though, even if I do understand it, I like for the math class to be about reasoning and discovery. Um, we don't use formulas. I call them the F word. And I say, we're not allowed to say the F word in my class. Uh, and I really want students to see, Hey, I can derive the Pythagorean theorem. I can figure this out. Like I can, I can do it. Not only is it so empowering, it teaches a conceptual understanding, so they're not relying on these procedures and steps, um, but they really are are seeing how math works and how we use reasoning and logic and problem solving every day in all aspects of our life, not just our math homework. Um, but then, then also there's just a, a sense of accomplishment and a pride uh, about learning math that doesn't exist when you teach them a formula and they follow a procedure. Um, they figured it out. Like I did that. Like that's not Pythagoras' theorem. That's my theorem. Like I can do it. I can <laughs> right. make it, you know? Uh, and that just brings a joy and a, just a deeper level of understanding that I, I, I it doesn't never gets old. I love to see it every time. I, there's so many things I want to say about that because one thing you said early on in that little section was this idea of, um, you know, when your reasoning improving in a math class and really what I, I, what I'm pulling from what you just said is this idea of empowering students to actually reason improve. And that is what teaching for conceptual understanding is. Whereas when we teach those formulas, the F word, you know, in our classroom, and we try to do that. And then we try to, like, I think the logical approach. This is how I thought when I wanted to start teaching conceptually, my thought was, well, I'll show them the formula and then I'll teach them how it works. And it really doesn't work like that because it's like, well, first of all, they already have a thing that's going to like do it for me. So half the classes off to the races are like, I'm not listening to this person anymore. But then it's like, you can't really teach conceptual understanding. You need to teach for conceptual understanding and rolling all the way back to being the person, the expert in the room. It's funny because in order for you to be the expert or sorry, for, in order for you to be a facilitator and facilitate learning experiences where students are reasoning, improving and inquiring and discovering, you have to be the expert. 
Whereas you can get away with memorizing a lesson the night before without necessarily being an expert in that lesson and teach for procedural, not even fluency, but you can teach for the procedure because you're not fluent if you're just teaching one procedure and you don't necessarily need to be an expert. So it's interesting because oftentimes, you know, that idea of being an expert is often hidden because you don't want to be the sage on the stage. So you move to the side but you've crafted, you've orchestrated this experience for students so that they can develop and bump into some of these ideas along the way. Now, where that expertise also is really important is helping them to be explicit and recognize what they've done. Because sometimes, you know, students will land on something and they've done something magical and we're excited because we're like, look at what you just did. And they're like, I got the answer seven. You know, like that's all they think they did. But I mean, you know, you're going like, no, it's something bigger. That's where that expertise is so key and critical is going, okay, here's what they did. Now, what do we do? You know, like now what's the next piece? What's the next repertoire that we want to put into place so that these students are going to then be able to dig deeper here. And then by the end of this lesson, as John always says, tie up the loose ends, right? Tie up the bow and go, holy smokes, like, you know, this, I want to let you know, you weren't the first person to discover what just happened here. You know, you're not the first one. I, I'm sorry if that lets you down, but in reality, here's what's happened. But here's the cool part is it took them a whole lot longer to discover it than it took you. Right. Which is like, think of how awesome that is. So I want to like shift right in to really what we're going to be talking about on this episode. And in particular, it's all about your challenge or your, I guess, um, you know, goal, your mission that you want mathematics, high quality mathematics and engaging mathematics materials accessible for all students. And one of the ways that you do this, and it aligns so nicely with what we do at Math Moments, is the idea of storytelling. How does storytelling help you as you try to create and provide these experiences for students so that they can truly learn and essentially learn for conceptual understanding. I think what's amazing about storytelling is that unlike almost all of the other like pedagogical approaches that I know of and that I've tried and that I've researched, it is effective for the entire spectrum. Uh, and the reason is that as humans, storytelling has been a part part of who we are right? mm -hmm. uh, is storytelling has been around as long as humanity has been around in civilizations. And it's how we pass on knowledge before writing systems even existed, right? It's people told stories from one generation to the next. Uh, and so it's already something ingrained in us, but there's something even better about it is that in math, everything is so scaffolded. And it's why teachers struggle all the time, right? You get a class in and some of them are at a second grade level and some of them are at a fifth grade level and you've got to teach this next concept and you got to get all of them up there, but it's really hard, right? You're trying to differentiate and do all this stuff and it seems like an impossible task. With storytelling, prerequisite knowledge is kind of optional. Uh, and mm. that's what I really love about it is that you can teach kids something really complex without having to build up all the previous things before it, because you tell a story in a way that relates to things that they just get. So for instance, we talk about the greatest common factor. Uh, and in my class, we acted out a little play and students played out numbers and they met at a park and they talked about, hey, what do you like to do? And what they like was what they're made of, their prime factors. And then they found, what do we have in common, right? Uh, and that was really easy for them. This is this topic that so many students struggle with. Like, wait, do I include mm. both of the twos? Do I only include one because right. it's kind of the same thing? Like, what do I do? But now it's like, hey, we're friends meeting in a park. We're talking about what's in common. Maybe we even say twos are... Taylor Swift. I think I did that in one class. We had someone who was a big Swifty. Uh, you know, like you really like Taylor Swift. This That's one, me. you know, has got one album, right? <laughs> like not a, not as big of a fan, but still a fan. Um, and talking about math in ways that really just connect to being a human and humanity, uh, mm -hmm. using our imagination. Uh, if you were a two, what would you be about? You know, right. uh, 
you're prime, you're even, like, what does that mean if, if two existed and was a human? Um, mm -hmm. And you really get to go over this barrier of prerequisite knowledge in this amazing way because it, it creates this equity across the room because we're all humans <laughs> mm -hmm. and we all know what it's like to be a human. Uh, and so now it's it's not so much of a struggle getting everyone on board because we're relating it to something that's so natural. Um, right, for sure, for sure. And and that's a that's a great example to kind of, you know, show the relationship in, you know, among, you know, greatest common factors and related actually to set note, to, you know, sets and in, in understanding what elements of different sets like it's it's so smart you know to think about how to bring that into we you know as a human i like i like that to think about like how how can we be more human in our math class is a really important aspect and and i'm curious on your thoughts because i think there's lots of you know different folks who might think they are storytelling or not like i'm we're curious about you know your interpretation of like what what that could mean, um, you know, like we've 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 talked to um, Sunil Singh here on our podcast a while ago. He's one of our first, but Sunil, we always look to Sunil to talk about storytelling. We've, we've sat in many of his sessions on on storytelling and mathematics, and he does a great job of bringing that in. And I think maybe his his version of, of his storytelling is is probably overlapping with other people's. But I think there's like classroom teachers right now who are like, yeah, I start my lesson by telling kids that they need to think like this, but I'm telling a story, you know, like, you know, I think there's like people who think they're telling stories and maybe not. So I'm curious, like, is your storytelling technique? Like, is it something we do at the beginning of a lesson? Is it in the middle? Is it all the way through? Like you, you gave us an example, but I'm, I'm curious to hear like more about like the, the structure of, of things that you go into when you're planning uh, what this looks like from start to end of a, of a class. So I'm a, I'm a bit of a crazy person. And I'm going to be really honest. I don't think that what I do is necessarily translates easily into every day in the classroom. Although I do think that you can take elements of it, obviously, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and do it. Um, I wrote a book, Marco the Great and the History of Numberville. And it is all the way like numbers are people. Uh, we, they have friends, they have, uh, they played in the vernacular arena, uh, where they, th you know, throw and run and toss and sling each other around. And it's this whole fantastical world meant to make a pre-algebra and algebra much more accessible and understanding. And so I have this sort of fantasy world that is really now easy for me to weave in to sort of all of my lessons. And anytime I kind of see kids confused, we can easily just kind of break off, say, hey, what would you think in this case, right? Like, let's turn this into a human thing and not a number thing, like a math a math thing, but like a human thing. And how would you react in this situation? Or what do you view this as? Um, but I don't think that that is necessary to use storytelling in the classroom, right? I think that the key elements of storytelling, in my opinion, um, are some sort of emotional connection. It, like, Mm. It, it, there's lots of times where you read aloud in a class and nobody cares <laughs> like you read your part you don't even comprehend it like you don't literally listen to everybody else mm -hmm. uh I think that it needs to have some sort of emotional connection to the students um and I think that it needs to be open to interpretation um, I think that that's one of the hardest things about teaching math is uh, especially when we think about procedures is we're like this is the right way um, and I think what storytelling does is it allows for creative problem solving and that that means there doesn't have to be a right way. So um, the story takes different forms for each student, right? We can start out with uh, with sort of a prompt and a lead in um, and let each student sort of interpret that how they see, like what connects to their specific experience. If we're talking about, you know, prime numbers or building primes, maybe one kid loves Lego, and so they can really understand Lego or Minecraft. I did a class where we talked about Minecraft. It was great for, like, the five kids who were obsessed with Minecraft. Right. Uh, for the other kids who don't play Minecraft, it really didn't connect to them. So I, right. I think that's a danger in storytelling, right, is, like, getting too into it, uh, and then you leave out half your audience. Um, so I think there has to be flexibility in there. Um mm -hmm. And imagination. I think that that's what that's mm -hmm. like the engagement part, right? Because because uh, everybody loves to sort of imagine and escape. Um, and I think that that's something that can really bring kids in and and get interested in it. I love it. I love you know the. I think the first one. I don't want to say any one of these ideas you just shared is more important than the other, but I would argue 
that without that emotional connection and whether it's like, sometimes people think, oh, emotional connection, like, does it have to be a touching story? Like, no, like emotional meaning that you as the facilitator are excited and engaged in the story that you are unfolding for your students, be it small or large, right? And I think, you know, John and I have been advocating for this idea of like using context in math class whenever and wherever possible, which to us, our interpretation is exactly what you are highlighting, where sometimes the context is a large, you know, journey and it can last for multiple days because the concept allows you to stretch it. You know, it's like a context that has legs that you just get to like kind of run with, which is great. But if it's a context and you, you know, the way we present it is, you know, you're reading it off the page or whatever, and you're just, you know, and we've been there, like you've been in a, a classroom where students are gathered around a teacher and they're telling a storybook, a picture book, and the teacher's right in there. And all the kids, like the teacher leans in, the kids lean in and like, everybody's like into it. But then you've also been in classrooms where a teacher, you know, they're reading a book and there's no change, you know, the intonation of the voice isn't changing. There's no, there's no sort of excitement around it. And it's like, if I'm not engaged in it as the facilitator, then how are you going to get your audience? Like I look at kids, like they are our audience. And when you have a public speaker or you have someone putting on a concert, or you have a stand-up comedian, like all of these people, you, you are essentially, some people say, oh, teaching and education, it's not an ed it's not an entertainment business, but I'm gonna say it 100% is an entertainment business. Now, the end goal isn't just to get a laugh or be interested, it's for learning. But if I can't get students to lean in in what I'm trying to share, that engagement piece, if I can't get them to even just behaviorally connect with what we're trying to do, then it's all for naught anyway. You know, like we're, we're not going to get to a place where 100% of the students that arrive at school are out of the box, eager and excited to learn. Now, I think they are naturally eager and excited to learn when there's interesting things to learn about, but we have a very, very great, great way of like stomping out all the curiosity in education, be it mathematics and other subject areas. So I just want to say, you know, that piece for me is such a important part when you are thinking about adding some of these ideas is that, you know, you're going to get what you put into it. And if you can't put that emotion into it, if you can't bring that yourself to become at least at least excited to share the idea with students. The question we should be asking ourselves is how do we expect students will become excited about it, right? So I love that idea. And I'm wondering if we were to go a little deeper down this rabbit hole, um, like how, like how might, you know, using storytelling throughout say the lesson or the experience of the lesson how might we extend that storytelling experience beyond say the, we'll call it the main topic or the main, we'll call it the entree of your, you know, your math lesson. I think that when you read a story, like a, a lot of the draw in reading is escapism, right? You're escaping to Hogwarts or magical world where right. things aren't what they seem or reality is different. Uh, and then with math, we're like, oh, it's so boring. <laughs> uh, but I would argue math is escapism, right? Like, it's very much like Plato's cave. Like, we're all sitting here, we're looking at the earth and the world, and we're like, all right, that's a tree. Like, we see it, we see it. Uh, and when you really understand math, you realize that numbers are everywhere, right? Like, they're pulling on you. Like, there's gravity and there's friction. And there is the, the light spectrum and how we see colors and like everything is numbers. It's like getting to like dive in there and realizing that there is this whole magical world that has been living around you, that you have been living in, that you really have been like blind to, right? Like that we don't think about how numbers dictate everything in our reality. Um, and so I think that you can use that storytelling to mm -hmm. uh, you know, address that core concept but I think that the ability to go deeper and outside of that is infinite, right? Like we can, you can pick anything and find numbers in it, like right. literally anything. Right? Yeah, true. Um, and, and I think that that's, what's so amazing with it. And that's, what's so underused and undervalued. I, um, I, I think that even as math teachers, we don't think of it that much, you yeah. know? Uh, and that's it. Speaking of a rabbit hole, that's a deep one. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know 
right? You know, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of, I think, storytellers, writers, you know, you being a writer, you know, when you train to be a writer or you do exercises, you know, to, you know, open your mind to, you know, this magical world when you go to write a story, there's lots of, you know, prompts I think people use to get started. You know, it's like, it's like, you, you know, you, you write a portion of a sentence and then you got to fill it in or you look at a picture, you know, and you're like, let me just pull up a picture and go, let me write a story about that. Like, what, what do you recommend for teachers? Like a lot of the teachers who listen to our podcast are math coaches, district leaders, you know, in charge of math PD, but also co you know, help teachers on a regular basis. Also math leaders who are in the classroom, you know, but also kind of like go next door and give suggestions to other teachers. And there are lots of people are just not saying just, but math teachers like, like I was wait. And so I'm, I'm curious, like, what do you, like, what are some of those prompts that say our listener can go, you know, like, I'm going to try that in my classroom, but I also can take that away and, you know, and, and share it with the, te the teachers that I work with. Yeah, we, we, when we kind of do events and stuff, we have um, a piece of paper, a one sheet, um, and we give it out to kids. So this could be something that the teacher does in terms of lesson mm -hmm. planning, or it could be something for the kids. Um, and we start with a concept. So pick any kind of math concept, whatever you are interested in. If it's a student or if you know we're preparing for a lesson, what do we want to teach? What's our goal? What's our objective, our learning objective? And then take a second and think about what does this remind you of? It's very much a simile situation, right? Like this is like, <laughs> what could you say this is like, you know? Um, so for instance, we use the distributive property as a wizard. Um, a wizard is casting a spell. He hits everybody, right? When you cast a spell, it hits everybody on the field. So when you use a distributive property, the wizard's casting everything. That's what I happen to think of. But, you know, my, another student thinks of something totally different when they're thinking about the distributive property. Uh, that's what's so fun about it. <laughs> and, and so ask it, what is this like? What If you had to make a movie of this, you know, if you had wanted to visually show this, what would this math concept look like? Um, and then that's where we start. Those are our first two prompt questions. And then the third is just write a little antidote about it, right? Explain the concept from your perspective. Um, and it's no longer than a paper. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be complex. Uh, it can be like, very simple and straightforward, but just try to relate this idea to your life or to a fantastical world, to something that you know about, to something that you feel like you understand that isn't math. Um, and then expand on that. And, and that, I think that opens up so many things because you can go down that hole deep, you know, like mm -hmm. kids can go really, really deep and like, oh, wait. And then if this is that, then this has to be right this. And it makes so much sense in my little magical world. And they're putting together math concepts without even knowing they're putting together math concepts uh, and, and proofs and understanding like math is all about relationships, relationships between numbers and between ideas. Um, without actually doing any formal math, just I by trying to find it in the world around them or in their imaginational world or in their experience. Well, I think, you know, a piece that's, you know, resonating with me right here is just this idea that math, you know, really math began in a concrete place. It began, began in the world around us, right? And, you know, then we started creating these abstract symbols to represent the world around us and how things work. And ultimately, when we get into more and more abstract concepts, sometimes we can get lost in that abstract world. And, you know, what I'm hearing from you is just the stickiness of having something that is, you know, that you can relate to, that you can sort of like hang your hat on a little bit and go, okay, like, here's where we're at, because this makes sense. I can now take the next step down this path you know, of abstraction and kind of relate it back. And, you know, now what am I going to think about? So I, I like, I like some of that idea, this idea that, you know, context story, um, you know, having something that you can, you can like rely on so that you're not left sort of in, you know, the middle of the dark wondering, where am I? Why am I here? Why do these rules work? And what do I do if I forget? Right. Cause I mean, Hey, if you've ever been lost before in the dark, it's hard to figure out where do you backtrack to, but if you have story and if you have context and if you have, you know, something you can connect it to, you can kind of do a little bit better of back mapping and kind of, you know, correcting your path and then moving forward to take the next step. So I think that's fantastic. I'm wondering from you 
friends, math moment makers out there are listening in. They've uh, heard all kinds of great ideas from you here today. If there was one thing that you hope that the math moment maker community will take with them from this episode here today, if it was just one thing, what's that one thing that you're hoping that they will leave remembering about this conversation here with you? I think that if we look at cognitive science and we look at how the brain works, it's like a puzzle piece trying to put it together. And math is made of a lot of complex ideas. As, as much as we might feel like one plus one equals two is really simple, it's really not, right? When you, when you get into advanced math and dig into it, it's really not. They're all very complex ideas. And people learn better when you can relate it to something you already understand. So if you are ever in the classroom and your kids are looking at you with that face that I, I, I've i seen, I know you all have seen, of, yep. of total just blankness, right? Like, I call I, it the X's over the eyes. You know, it's like they have they have completely turned off. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what's going on. Um, Remember that. And remember, like, can you, like, what is this like? Like, again, like the simile, right? What is this like that they already get? Because it's not memorization then, right? It's 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 building on, on existing schema. It's connecting to previous knowledge. And that knowledge doesn't have to be math knowledge, right? There's nothing that says it, 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 that it needs to be math knowledge. And if you can connect that idea to something that they like or that they enjoy or that they already understand, the gains from that are going to be tremendous. Like it's yeah. just hands down because it. it's easier for them to understand it. They don't hate it anymore. They're engaged in it now. They've got a much more positive view towards it. Like I, I could go on and on and on because right. there are so many gains from that. Um, just not teaching the rule, but really teaching the heart and teaching to the the students and, and what, what do they get? What do they like? What do they know? And how can this connect to that? How can this concept connect to that? Love it. Love the, I love that last line there. You said, it's like, we're not, we're not teaching this rule. We're teaching, we're teaching to the heart. And I think that's, that's, that's such a great message. I think to leave with the, our listeners and, and people who are going to the classrooms, you know, in an hour or, you know, tomorrow or, you know, in a, in a week. So, uh, Shayla, we want to thank you for joining us here on the Making Math Moments that pod, uh, Matter that podcast. Um, where can our listeners? They've been, you know, they've been leaning in. They're they're wondering. You know, you said resources. You said books. Where could they reach out to you? Where can they find more about you? Yes, and I I love to talk to other educators. That's one of the greatest passions. Um, you can find me at mathbait.com. Um, bait like a fish. I actually like clickbait, right? Um, math bait, making math interesting. Um, and the book Marco the Great and the History of Numberville is available wherever books are sold. Awesome. awesome. That's fantastic, my friend. Uh, Sheila, this has been a awesome conversation. Uh, the sun is now shining also where we are. And uh, I want to thank you for that because I think uh, this conversation kind of convinced the sun to come out here for us. It was a little gloomy before <laughs> we hit record. So good on you. And uh, Math Moment Makers, go connect with Shayla. And uh, hey, keep on doing the great work. And uh, we look forward to connecting with you again sometime. Thank you so much. Thanks. It was such a pleasure to meet you both. I would love nice. to... <laughs> Talk more. I'll be a. I, I will continue to be a fan and a listener. Um, <laughs> I feel like we awesome. could have so many good conversations. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> we will. We will. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks a ton, my yeah. friend. We appreciate you. And uh, no, this episode is going live-ish. John, when would it be going? Um, soon? Actually, soon. I think we're sliding this one yeah. in on Monday. No, I maybe. I, I gotta look. I gotta look. I, it I'm might be sure coming exactly. up soon. If it not, up it's soon. coming up we late. We might slide it in. <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> Try yeah. economy, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Keep your eyes peeled, but we appreciate you. Thanks a ton. And uh, yeah, go enjoy that sun. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you both. Take care. Thanks. Take care now. Take care. Bye now.